Good morning. Welcome to the stream. Thank you all for being here. Plan is catching up on some news. There's a few uh, different Reaper scripts and related topics that I'd like to cover. I've got links in the description already. Um, but if something else comes up, I'll, of course, add that uh, as we go through this. And other than that, uh, yeah, I put in a little poll in the chat. Um, I want to know, did you reap this week? 75% of you are saying yes. And, you know, I'm not going to explain what reaping means. But, yeah, um, I did a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. I've been uh, thinking of what I could provide as a a way to get started with a Reaper 7. Something that, not overwhelming the amount of content, but something useful. Um, something that is sort of often, uh, you know, uh, maybe a downside of starting with Reaper is it just comes with nothing. So I thought maybe I could build something up to be a, a good free resource for people starting with Reaper 7 or, you know, just want a free collection of samples. So I started recording some samples from my PolyD uh, yesterday as a, a starting point. And I think we'll add in a bunch of other samples that I've recorded in the past and maybe some of the other synths and things that I have and get some like drum samples, some synth patches uh, or synth sort of waveforms that can be used to start songs to use with the examples for the Fresh Start series, maybe those sorts of things. I'll probably also have maybe a PDF with links to where you get the extensions, where you get um, some additional plugins. So the Kilohertz Essential Bundle, I would recommend that these days. I was just thinking yesterday that it kind of replaces the the Air Creative Effects Bundle pretty close. Um, it doesn't have the ducking plugin. But uh, other than that, it can do quite a lot. Is it possible to show Reaper 7, seeing it is available in pre-release? Um, yeah, pre-releases aren't really supposed to be shown. Um, but you can always try it out on your own system. This week, I'm actually using a different theme. So I'm actually using, what's the theme? The Reaper Tips theme with a few small changes. Um, I haven't used this a ton. I think I, I used it on the, the week that it came out, then I came back to it this week. So uh, we're just not supposed to talk about Reaper 7 all that much. It's supposed to be kept a secret until it's released, um, just because so many things can change. Joe Clark says, I tried out RC4 this week on 2011 MacBook Pro, and it was so snappy and fast. It's actually crazy that the 2011 MacBook is still working. Yeah, I've retired two MacBook Pros already. Yesterday, I... Just recording some samples. So some different uh, synth waveforms from the Poly D and some drum sounds from the Poly D, like this, uh, this 808 sample. Which might be cool. These are just like the raw recordings, so they uh, they will get processed. Here's a little example. some of the sort of sounds that I was going to put into that pack. Yeah, that's just like the first, I don't know, maybe hour of of working on, on that thing. It's coming up with a workflow and figuring out what's useful, what's not. That's what I've been up to this week. Yeah, Jason, um, that was something I wanted to talk about. Uh, Kilohertz uh, faceplant was... was... Uh, updated this week uh, i just updated all the stuff last night but i didn't try anything out new non-linear filter in the generator section that sounds interesting i don't even know what a non-linear filter is exactly i've been watching a lot of phase plant tutorials the past couple of days i kind of want to do like a a tier list of kilohertz plugins and like rank them from s tier to F. I don't know. Is that an interesting thing to do? I actually haven't even tried them all, I bet. There's like 30 plugins in the Essentials Bundle. All right, so first bit of news here. I, I mentioned the, the DAW file format 
last week. Just to recap is Bitwig and Persona Studio One combining forces on a new plugin or no, a new DAW file format. Something that can be used in either of those DAWs uh, back and forth without issues. I think it was just maybe two days later after our last stream, Moss, or Driven by Moss, extension creator, uh, Jorgen, I forget his name. I forget his last name. Mossberg, I think, something like that. Um, he created Project Con Converter. So I'm going to open that up here. Yeah, version 1.1 of this has come out. This was on the 1st of October. So what, that was that, Saturday or Sunday. And uh, seems to work. So you can get a Reaper project converted to this DAW project format, and then you can open it in Studio One or in Bitwig. So it's cool that it's that quick, that's already been done. I, I mentioned that it probably very quickly before that happens. And yeah, he did it immediately, which is awesome. But he um, he has been following this project um, for two years already before like the all the public announcements and everything. So now Reaper projects can be opened in two other DAWs, which is pretty cool. And also the other way. I don't have Bitwig or Studio One to test this myself, but if you do, check out the link and um, and support this project. Yeah, people seem pretty stoked about that. Experiencing quite a bit of lag when I'm zooming in and out. Do I um, do I have mouse modifiers to minus ten percent a few times? A lag when zooming in and out. Is it always lagging? Or is it just when you get to a certain point? Because there is a point where you zoom in and it's no longer reading the peak files, but it's reading the files directly off the hard drive. Um, so if you're talking about like zooming in to a few milliseconds in the timeline, then that could be it. And, and different file formats might trigger that differently. Uncompressed media versus compressed media might have a different lag. Can't remember if there's some settings for that. Oh, there is a peak cache resolution. Might might be a thing. Um, preferences media. So I've got the default here. I'm on a very fast hard drive. Uh, the, it's the my peak caches are saved on the system drive, so it's super fast on a Mac Studio. If you lowered yours to zero, okay. I think larger cache is better. I don't know. I haven't experimented with that too much. But I have seen that happen before, and it was generally reading the, the peak caches that was the, the issue. GPU shouldn't make a difference, but the the speed of the hard drive, if it's a SSD, if it's a uh, M.2 or, or or like the, the Mac Studio, the, the drive is solid state and it's soldered to the motherboard and it's extremely fast it could be that it could be something else but if it's if it's really if it's always zooming then i'm not 100 sure but if it's zooming in super close to files where it there's this like transition between the cached peak file and the actual file i would guess that it's hard drive speed related but anything that's not a mechanical drive should be okay but yeah the media thing the caches can make a difference with this sort of thing. I've seen it before, but I don't think I've seen it in the past probably three or four years. So uh, I don't know if it's still an issue. All right, so another bit of news. VB Audio, you might know them from their voice meter software, voice meter banana and potato, or virtual audio cable. They have a new software called Matrix, which is kind of similar to some of the other ones. This is your way of creating aggregate devices on Windows. You can collect all your different Windows devices, USB mics, um, ACO devices, create new output devices, um, multi-channel, of course, that you can route into OBS or Discord or into Reaper or whatever. This is Windows only. Um, I installed it on my Windows system yesterday we spent probably five minutes trying to figure it out. It's pretty complicated. 
I think we could kind of figure it out. We didn't get too deep into it. Um, oh, I should also mention that this also works with their um, V-band, they call it. So they've got like a network audio thing as well. 680 inputs and outputs in this virtual audio router. You know, just to get a couple USB mics down to stereo to record into OBS or something like that, it can be a useful thing. It's free. Check it out. Link's in the description of the video uh, if you want to check that out. I think there is a, a steep lear learning curve with it. I didn't intuitively figure it out, which isn't saying much, but I can generally figure things out within a couple minutes of clicking and right-clicking. But I think it's worth checking out if you haven't, uh, if you don't have some sort of solution for this already. The free voice meter software is pretty useful to uh, combine inputs, hardware inputs and software inputs into one software, which you can then record through OBS or uh, a way to capture audio from system sounds into Reaper. Uh, this can be very useful for that. There is basically like more inputs, and I think some of these can use VST plugins, but I might be wrong about that. But yeah, you can combine multiple inputs and have this sort of virtual mixer that goes in between um, all your devices, all your software, and your recording software, your streaming software. So very popular free software for using this or donationware. Just to mention. Yeah, um, all those things... They do have lots of latency, Davi was saying. Foam Dog, yes, you can have multiple in, uh, interfaces with that. Do I need VB cable, audio matrix, and OBS if I wish to use four channel audio interface as a crossover to two channel active speakers? I want to create the crossover with ReEQ. Don't know if I would do it that way. I don't know about that. If you have one audio interface with four outputs, you could just set Reaper's mixer to output on four channels and use the crossover and create a crossover that way. Um, I've never really done any crossover stuff um, that's not built into the speakers already. Oh, I, I think you wanted to route audio from other sources into it. Then, yeah, um, VB cable is a way to get the audio from other software into Reaper. Then you can process it and then send it out again. I always forget... There's virtual audio cable, and then there is VB cable. They're two very similar names. One of them worked for me, one of them doesn't, and I cannot figure out... I don't remember which one it is. But I'm pretty sure the VB audio stuff worked for me. Getting audio from Reaper to OBS, Restream is... Yeah, I use that quite a lot. Yeah, I, I use many different options with that. If you own an interface with SPDIF in and out, you can use that for loopback. Yeah, that's a good lossless audio loopback source. A lot of Windows apps don't always see, well, Windows or Mac, they don't always see all the inputs of your audio interface. Like OBS is terrible for that. You have an eight channel audio interface. You can only use channels one and two and you can't use them separately. Uh, it's pretty annoying. So sometimes you need to use software like voice meter to to get those separate channels right to pan them and then unpan them once you're in obs things like that it's kind of annoying uh another quick mention this website from xrame there's times when somebody's asking you for an action um and you don't remember the name of it or um you don't know if it exists maybe there's a particular thing that somebody's looking for in Reaper, you don't have Reaper open at the moment, you could open up this website, which has the full list of the built-in actions and many of the scripts that are built or that come with the defaults of Repack. So what's the name of the action for um, track height? And so we can type in track height and then this sorts it, we can sort it by alphabetical or relevance. Or maybe it's zoom vertical. And then there's all the vertical zoom actions that are there. What are the freeze actions? And then there's all the scripts in Reback or the built-in ones. So maybe this is niche, but if you spend a lot of time on the forum helping people 
and maybe you don't have Reaper on that computer or you're doing it from your phone or whatever it is, you can also um, bold it. And so when you click on this, it will paste in looking like that with the uh, BB code formatting. So you can link to this page as well. Pretty useful thing, I think. I just found out about it this morning, but it's been up here for over a year. This script came out this week. It's called RS5K Mapper. And this is a way of managing layers and velocities and um, not key switches, but I forget, um, MIDI note, where the MIDI note uh, range is for Resample-Matic 5000. So this is in Repack. You just need to find that. So you go to the Repack Browse Packages. And this was, uh, if you search for RS5K, should come up here, RS5K Manager. Just right click uh, and set to install and then apply. RS5K Manager Mapper, not Manager Mapper. And so this is a, a little UI for showing you where your your keys are on the uh, Resample Matic 5000. So we can scale the note start, scale the note end, how, how far that note is stretched. We can set it to certain velocity ranges. Um, those sorts of things, pretty useful. And then when you have multiple resample matics on a project or in a in a track, so we've got one of the these here, two of these here, and you can overlap them. You can see where the where all the things lie. And as you're changing this, this UI is actually changing the pitch start and the pitch offset. Uh, options within that uh, that instrument. That's basically it. If it's confusing when you're using it, it's because Resample Matic 5000 is confusing, especially with how the pitch start and note start and things interact. You can also do this detect pitch thing. Any changes you make in in here also affect the um, not pitch offset. What is it? Note start. Uh, also affect the mapper UI. So it's it's about as intuitive as it can be because this is confusing itself. Seems like a pretty useful script. It's free. Um, I think it's the creator's first script. Um, I didn't recognize their name or anything on the on the forum. Only three posts, but pretty simple, pretty useful. And uh, yeah, again, links are in the description. Okay, going back to the chat, Ryan says, I use Reaper to restream, to OBS, to VB cable, to Discord. Okay, interesting. Okay, so what do you do in OBS for audio processing that couldn't be done uh, just going like Reaper to Discord or Reaper to VB cable to Discord? Focusrite allows you to s expose all the IO for third gen Scarlets. That's good, that's nice. So my OBS shows just a few different things. Um, for mics, not much. Like it's just audio fuse, not the 18 different inputs for audio fuse. So it's like kind of limited. If I select uh, audio fuse, there's no like sub options or anything like that. Maybe that's more of a Mac thing. If I go to audio devices, go to the audio fuse, it's 14 inputs. These should all be available, but they're not. Yeah, the edited video will be out like next Thursday of this. What are we doing now? What do you want to do? That was half an hour. That's all I had prepared. Have I found a simple way of adding fades to items in one click? One click? I Well, I can show you the way that I usually do. So I've got some items here. I'm going to right drag to marquee select them. And then I hold shift and then I drag in the corner and I can do that. Or else I could go to item properties. No, not that. No. 
item properties. Oh yeah, it's just double click. I don't know why I forgot that. And then I could set the fade to like, um, I don't know, 0.45. And then shift enter will we'll set that for all of them. But you can also create scripts for specific amounts of a fade. Yeah, fade items, 10 milliseconds. If I zoom in here, we'll see that. I use ChatGPT for that. I have a video about the AI actions. I also have a video on batch fade editing, or might be just for fades. I don't remember if it's for everything. Holding shift generally does all the selected items. If not, check your mouse modifiers for media item edge, left drag. Relative edge edit means due to all selected. Surprise, there's no native actions to add fades. Yeah, generally people do it from the um, item properties. So if you double click on one of these, you just type that in. I assume that's what people do. Uh, there's actions to change the fade shape to the different types. Yeah, but for like specific lengths and stuff, I don't really see anything. Um, I should also mention that like F and G is what I use for fade, start, and end. So there's G and there's F. So it's wherever you parked your cursor. I don't think those those aren't default actions, but... I use these two actions quite a lot. The remove fade in and fade out actions are pretty helpful as well. Uh, I've pasted a bunch of samples before and then decided to add effects to them. Is there an easy way to add a copied effects to all selected media items? Uh, yeah. So I think if you have them selected and then you open up a effect, I don't know, this filter. Right click on it, add to active takes of selected items. Yeah, I don't think there's anything like shift, drag that does that. Might be wrong. No, it's not. If you have a shortcut for the... For the... For the plugin, then uh, I think you can do that as well. I don't know if I even have any right now. Insert. Insert not found. So I'll remove those. Insert VST recomp. So if I select this. Yeah. So if I select a, a few of these. And then. Add. That did add to both of those items. A few different ways. Probably the, the right click select is the fastest way. The be the fastest render settings while bouncing. I opened a project with effects in offline mode and still only get four times when I recall I've had 40 times the speed before. I'm not 100% sure what causes slow renders. I think there is a limit depending on the format. If you're rendering to wave, it should be very fast. But if you're rendering to MP3, AAC, or video files, then there's some sort of speed limit there with the conversion process. And I don't know why. Unprocessed audio is usually extremely fast. I don't think there's really anything as users that we can do to make it go faster. Render to a uncompressed format like WAV and then batch convert it to MP3 or something like that. So it doesn't have to process those things. The more the more steps of conversion there are, so if you're changing the bit depth, if you're changing the sample rate, if there's oversampling involved, uh, if you're normalizing and limiting at the master, all those things add time. Probably the format makes the biggest difference. In my Reaper, I've been noticing MIDI inputs seem to be slightly delayed. In FL Studio, the MIDI input seems to be more correct and the timing seems to be more correct. Any suggestions? It could be... Maybe not really the MIDI is being delayed, but there is the audio device isn't reporting the latency correctly, or it's being delayed by, um, let me just show you the thing. Preferences, audio recording, 
um, the driver reported latency, and there's the manual offsets. So uh, this can affect your the MIDI as well. So you have to do a loopback test. So connecting an output to an input, recording that, figuring out what the offset is, and adding or subtracting that from the um, reported latency is the best thing to do. Depending on the output, if it's an audio output, output versus a SPDIF output versus MIDI output, you could probably test. That may have a different number and you kind of just have to choose the best option. And it's also affected by sample rate and block size. It's always going to be a compromise. It's usually pretty close. Most users don't need to do this unless like you're saying you've got uh, a slight delay or it's ahead of the beat always. This is something to look at. This is, as far as I know, this is the only number that you can change. Block size affects MIDI and audio latency. Plugins in the session can delay the audio output, so then you start playing later and later. It'd be really nice if Reaper or if Discord grabbed the audio from Reaper when you stream the application like it does for streaming a web browser or game. You might need to change your audio device or uh, audio system to a different mode. So um, I'm on a I'm on Mac, but it's the same preference page, Reaper preferences, or audio device. And so your audio device on Windows, it's going to be like ACO or Direct Sound or Wasapi. ACO is not going to play out to Discord or anything else. It can It's communicating directly with the audio interface. But the other modes, Direct Sound or Wasapi, should be able to pass through to uh, Discord so long as the sample rate's the same and, I don't know, the phase of the moon. There may be a good use of using the thing we mentioned before, the matrix or or voice meter, create an audio uh, aggregate device for the situations where you're streaming to Discord. The Reaper 7 resource pack, let's talk about that a bit more. I want to have some drums, synths, foley, ambience loops, and miscellaneous sounds. I've already forgotten what I meant by mis miscellaneous. I guess things like vinyl loops or rain I'd like to put in there. You know, just little bits of song starters or, or things that we can use for the examples for the, the lessons. The kilohertz bundle, uh, complete start bundle, it's probably worth putting in there. I'm on the fence about recommending labs these days. Suggestions for like third-party plugins that are free, that work on Windows and Mac, and you find useful. This question goes to the live chat and to people watching later. Uh, yeah, what do, what do you find useful? What do you think a new user would like to have that is missing from Reaper natively? Or maybe just a, a different option. Is there a way to paste a longer item into a shorter area of time selection or razor edit? For example, making a selection of room tone and then making a selection only pasting inside the selection. I think I had a workflow for that. There was something in SWS resources, I seem to recall. I'm, I'm kind of stumped on that one. I'm pretty sure I've done it before. It's something that is better for scripting because it's sort of a non-linear process. Like step by step, it's not really a simple thing to do. Within a script, you can like modify like the clipboard contents so that it fits before you paste it. Something like that. This will be cut from the video where I, I flounder around and do I have experience with triggering acoustic drums with Reaper I'm trying using piezo triggers but I have a hard time finding good settings using audio MIDI slate's trigger plugin is really good trigger two very good yeah the gate in this is very good it usually does everything you need um another thing you can do though is process the audio before you're triggering plugins so denoising it can help you might not need to gate it but something like a transient shaper or transient designer can really help filtering out excess frequencies so like super low frequencies or super high frequencies sometimes that helps um, if you do it on a duplicate track then render those uh, those modifications to it like the the transient shaper and then you can run trigger on it and it will trigger much easier something else uh, especially when you're layering the sounds i've actually found it useful to trigger 
a synth just doing a little beep just to get the timing right. Triggering a similar sound doesn't always work to, to tell you if it is correct. So I actually trigger a synth sound, like just resynth after your audio to MIDI thing. And now I find that that's way easier to tell if something's in time or not. Uh, I think there's a free version of this. I don't know. I've had this since it came out, so I don't actually know uh, if there's a free version. I'm pretty sure there was or, or is a free version. Um, if you're not using that, there's the audio to MIDI drum trigger plugin. But if you put in a search for transient, yeah, transient controller, set the attack to like 50% and sustain at minus 25, that can be all you need for much cleaner triggers. George says there's a free version of Slate Trigger. It has some missing features. Yeah, it should still trigger uh, audio to MIDI or audio to built-in sounds. Free trigger doesn't convert to MIDI. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense that some features are taken out. Looking at post fader options for Reaper, surprise it doesn't have any. Yeah, but we have infinite tracks. You can always put one more track ahead of it or use a different plugin as your fader. I don't know. It's never bothered me. It's never been a workflow that I cared about. Are there different methods for healing a split on multi-take track? Usually use Control Shift G for single take tracks. Uh, Control Shift G, that's glue, isn't it? Uh, healing's a bit different than glue. I actually don't worry about healing splits unless it's like I have to put that sound file into some other plugin. If it's just in the session, I just leave the the edits with the fades and everything. I might lock the items, um, but I don't I, I don't really uh, have any need to glue things. If I'm sending the files to someone else after doing the edits, then I'll use the consolidate function. There's some good glue scripts as well. Yeah, uh, glue tools is the one that's my go-to because it gives you options for gluing individually with or without fades, things like that. I find it pretty useful. Aligning effects channels or sends to the right of the mixer. There is something like that. You can group things to the left, but not to the right. If you click on the little icon, gear icon, or the I icon, info icon, there's group folders to the left and group tracks that have receives to the left. But there's no option for grouping to the right, unfortunately. I think I've asked for something like that before, I've, or I've noticed it. And uh, yeah, going from like a real console to that thing, it does seem like there's something missing. Kelly, your alert didn't come through. There it is. A succulent Chinese meal. There we go. Took a while. Uh, so Kelly, will hardware effects used via reinsert be printed on the mix down or is it better to patch them so they are recorded directly onto the track? Okay, so if you render your project in real time, this option, where it says full speed offline, you want to make sure that that says online render, and then those effects will be rendered into your master mix. Essentially that is true, or you can render it to individual tracks. And that's kind of just helpful just to render or kind of make a freeze of that. So uh, yeah, super, super useful to do it either way, but you do at least have to render it once in real time. Okay, yeah, if you render faster than real time, yeah, your hardware effects are not gonna come through, but if you do the online render, Reaper will be rendering at normal speed, and so all your hardware effects will be working as well. The faster than real time just bypasses all the hardware IO. Uh, what music have you been listening to lately? The new album from Gunship, I've been listening to a lot. Unicorn from Gunship, I've been listening to quite a lot. Night Versus, Every Sound Has a Color in the Valley of Night, Part 1. Super good. Amazing guitar effects in some of these songs. I think it's Arrival. It has this really crazy, fast, delayed guitar part that I cannot figure out. I think it's a specific pedal that does it, but I want to try to get that sound. 
Um, highly recommend this. Crazy drumming, crazy fast playing, but it's not like speed metal or anything like that. It's just like, I don't know, really good. Hard rock, instrumental, ambient. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Those are the probably the two most recent new albums that I've been listening to a lot of. A lot of you out there are throwing your money away. Uh, I always feel stupid when using dynamic split items randomly, uh, pulling the main slice length and min slice length bar, not really knowing what I'm doing. I often want to remove speech between songs. Explain if there's a good workflow for using dynamic split. I mean, it's it's a it's a tricky thing, kind of, especially with multi-tracks. I don't love dynamic split. I, I might mess around with it for like 10 minutes and then go back to manually splitting. Yeah, uh, for voices between music, I, I would think that the gate is your way of, of going. Transients is more for drums. And, and these are, are good for the other options. A lot of you out there are throwing your money know. away may not be super useful for you. Not always the best tool for doing this stuff. Sometimes it's just getting really fast at, at that kind of thing or setting up a, a split tool or something like that uh, ends up being the faster way of doing it. That's my experience with it. Um, it can be really good, but it's... It's not always great. Like for drums, I almost never use it because I end up having to manually clean up every single edit, so I may as well just edit it myself. There is this other tool, which some people say works differently than Dynamic Split. It's a lot less visual, so I don't like it. That may be something to, to check out. If it's like less than 100 edits, I would just do it manually. Reaper continues to not offer a simple and direct real-time MIDI chord identifier. There is kind of one in the MIDI editor, but it leaves a lot to be decided. Anything new about that? Good question. I would bet that Feed the Cat has one. Because there was one in the... Or maybe it was just notes. In here, there was that script. In the MIDI Explorer MX Tuner. But I guess that's not chords. Yeah. Actually, I don't know. That would be something useful. I don't know why they don't have that. Any tricks for manually editing drums faster or for a better end result? Yeah. Don't listen to every single edit as you're doing it. Make sure you get a significant amount of work done before you go back and listen. Because so much of your time will be wasted playing back things that you already know are good. And because you have to play it back in real time, that's minutes taken away from editing. The other thing is make sure you're working at a constant zoom level. Don't zoom in and out frequently. Your zoom level is basically your quantize amount. Have presets made up for how much zoom you're using and then only use like two zoom levels. Like zoom in to two or four bars and don't zoom in further than that. And if you want to see your progress in the whole song, you do the zoom out to project shortcut and you can see how many more bars you have left. You know, at least do like the full chorus before you go back and play it. Because, yeah, the more time you spend listening to your edits, especially when you know that they're good, the more time you waste. You're better off doing the entire edit. Granted, you have to have some experience with the editing already. You have to know what you're doing. But you should, at some point, know what a good edit looks like. And you can predict that's going to sound good. So let's say you do the entire chorus, then you go back and you listen through it once. And if you notice any glitches, you can drop markers as you're playing it back, or you can stop there and fix it right away. For me, that was kind of the biggest thing that saved time, having the confidence to keep going rather than constantly check and check and check. Honestly, that cuts hours out of your editing time. And then other than that, just making sure that there's like efficient movement with your editing. I showed fast edit mode in a recent video. I can do almost all the edits with just the right hand. Uh, somebody suggested in the comments of that that I use a tool that basically emulates left click on the keyboard. So clicking with my left hand and just pointing with my right hand, that can be helpful. 
I've also set it up so that fade position and nudging items is done through um, knobs on a control surface. That was pretty cool workflow. And I would do that again if I had um, uh, a lot of editing work to do again. But I, I, I stopped advertising for that. So hasn't come in for a while. Uh, Jason suggests scaler for cord ID. Yeah, I've never checked it out, but I'm sure that any third party tool is going to handle that, that really well. Yeah, I hope you are already slip editing. It ends up being faster for me to slip edit than to use dynamic split in most cases. One more thing with the editing topic. So what does it look like to work at a constant zoom level? So it's like this. Oops. So if I'm editing this, I might only zoom in this far or only this far or only this far, but I'm consistent about where, um, what I'm doing. I have three zoom levels. And if I want to zoom out the entire project, I have one other action for that. And then one to return to that zoom level. So let's, let's break that down. So my number six key, zoom in one measure. I don't know if these scripts are actually public, but maybe you can screenshot this or I don't know, I could link you to it. I don't think this is in repack because this was something that Christian Villian made for me. It's zooming to a specific amount of time, uh, which is getting, it's not getting it from the name, it's getting from it from line two. So yeah. I've got a few of these. I've got one for one measure, two measures, and four measures. Then I also use this action, zoom out project, and this action, undo zoom. Hopefully that clears it up. Those are my, my main zoom actions. Um, so I just resist the urge to, to mouse zoom in all the time when I'm editing. Because if your crossfades are set right, you shouldn't need to move things. You can see that my my fade is on the left, and that's because, um, well, I'm using a custom split thing, but split, fade, left, split, selected items at edit cursor with crossfade on left. Super important to use that, that script when you're, uh, or this, SWS action if you are drum editing because otherwise the split's going to be in the middle and you're killing your transient so you have to go and move it every single time yeah just use this saves you time yeah so uh slip editing that's pressing s to split uh before a transient or, or on the grid line if the thing's late and then you alt drag to bring it to the grid line and like I said before, make sure that you're in a, you kind of pick your zoom level. So I press either six, seven, or eight, essentially setting my cross, my, uh, quantize amount, qu quantize strength based on the zoom amount. So if I can see like that, then this is more quantized than if I was this far out and then dragging it. But. Yeah, this is this is one bar that I'm zoomed in. Realistic drum sounds don't need to be sample accurate. You're talking about quantizing dependent on zoom level. Would it matter for slip editing? Yeah, clarifying not using the quantize function, but using your zoom amount as your quantize for your eyeballs kind of thing. You can control the length of the crossfade uh with the action you showed yeah so the length of the crossfade is going to be set in your um your media item defaults so uh it's these overlapping crossfade when items when splitting i think i'm pretty sure that's where that's set three milliseconds that's 10 milliseconds I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was following this, but I have this turned off. So I don't know. I am using a cycle action for my split. Smart split 
if autocross fade media items when editing is on split selected items at edit cursor with crossfade on the left and set the snap offset to cursor or else split items at edit or play cursor which is the default edit action and do nothing else yeah so that's just following this button here so if that's on normal split no crossfade or split with crossfade AK5K says it could be on the grid as long as it has natural dynamics and not 127 velocity. Yeah, I like the sound of gridded drums, honestly. It's like having an interest in electronic music and industrial music and stuff like that. Like, I like my heavy metal the same kind of way. So, like, I just hear all the timing different uh, timing issues in, like, classic rock and stuff. And it just it takes me out of the moment for me. I assume hardware effects used on a send track also needs some real-time rendering. Yeah, so you can set the track to record output and then hit record and it will uh, will record after the hardware effects or another send to another track. But again, that would probably need to be set to record output or what's the other option? I'm forgetting one. You can set like don't use reinsert just use a send and then a new track to re receive that and then record the input it's not going to be latency compensated the same way that reinsert would so i would prefer to use that is there a way to favorite actions without adding shortcuts i don't think so that's an interesting interesting thought toolbars or custom menus probably the closest for that so if you customize a toolbar Make a toolbar of, of your favorites. We've got 16 floating toolbars, so you can just add your favorites in here. Whether you use them or not, maybe that's, that's helpful. I was going to say action list can have... You can add certain things to the action list, but it's only custom actions. Oops. So if I go to a custom action and I edit this, there's this action to show an actions menu. That's kind of the only like shortcut thing other than menu editing. You can always just edit the menu. Let's go to the main actions. So you can see here that my action list is pretty basic, but the actual menu has a lot more things because there's the recent things and there's the custom actions and the running scripts. But you can add more things to this if you have favorite actions that you want to remember where they are, but you don't necessarily want them on a key. Putting them in the actions menu is one way to do it. You do have to watch out for like the order of this one is kind of special because it has these sort of dynamically created sections. Hopefully that explains it. I would probably do a toolbar personally or good old paper and pencil. Just make a list. The ones you need to remember. Logosana radial menu. Yeah, that's a good one, but a lot of steps to get that set up. I don't think I even have that. Uh, I do. I guess I do have it still assigned to a keyboard. I I wish I could get fluent with this, but I, I never have. It's very good for certain workflows, but I cannot get into it. I, I just got a mouse with more buttons as, as my workaround. You want to see what I bought this week? It's kind of silly. We haven't done this thing today. Behold. My stuff. I bought a new microphone. I bought one of these. <laughs> How many people have had one of these in the past? Please tell me you've you've owned something like this. There's like the the classic desktop mic for talking on MSN or whatever. No, I didn't own one myself. I I growing up I didn't have internet at home most of the time. There there's a few different companies that made these. This one's by Cost, but Logitech is the one I've seen. Um Podcastage is a YouTube channel. He did a review like a full mic review, like as if it was a brand new microphone. He did it 
totally serious review of it. It was very funny. Would you pay $3 for that? I don't know. I don't have a way of actually connecting it to an interface, which is crazy. And you know what? I don't even know if this is a dynamic or a condenser. It must be an electric condenser because it doesn't need power. But you don't see dynamic mics that small. $3 worth it to you? So that's the mic for the PC. I like it. I, how old is it? I don't know. I couldn't even find the exact model online yesterday, but uh, I don't know. There's a lot of things that are similar to that. It's got to be from the like late 90s, maybe 1998. Looks like the mic off a of Novation Mini Nova. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. it very well could be. Still quite impressed with your $20 mic for live streaming. I don't think you need a, like the most good, like the most fancy mic to live stream. And as long as there's not like constant noise. Well, I mean, look at the top streamers. Their audio sucks, but they provide other things. I don't know. Hopefully my audio sounds good most of the time. The hard part of streaming audio for me is... Uh, Sibilance, plosives, background noise, and room tone, or like just the echo. It drives me crazy when people have like, you know, some cheap mic or no mic. They just talk into the webcam and there's so much room tone and just, you know, they don't care. Nobody cares about audio quality. Yeah. Yeah, too much room tone. It's hard to like... um to focus on it. Th that was one of the things we used Goyo. The first time we tested Goyo. Or maybe it was the Acon Digital software. Maybe that's what it was. Um, but yeah, I, I've... If I still want to watch the video, even though the audio sucks, I will process my... Um, I will use software to process like the output of Firefox. Um, this has been really handy to, um, fix mono issues. Um, so some, like, uh, I'll just bypass this most of the time. When I turn it on, it sums the audio to mono because people will, um, upload things with the left and right channels out of phase, or they will, um, it'll be like left channel only. So I'll just put in mono often or with the background noise there's the uh with acon digital's d reverberate this worked pretty well or there's the goyo plugin things like that very useful but i'm a nerd like that i wanted to stream with that new mic but i just don't have a good way of connecting it to a computer or connecting it to a mac it doesn't have xlr out so i don't know what to do i want to i do want to hear the mic I'm just not sure what I can connect it to. I, I tried just plugging it in to the audio interface with one of the uh, like headphone adapters, but it didn't work. Let's try plugging it into the camera. Yeah, great sound quality on this stream. The Zoom H5. Happy to report it's no longer sticky. It's still not sticky after rubbing all the crap off of it. Uh, but let's see if we can get a signal on the uh, line in. Okay, so I got audio working on that. Professional streamer here spending 20 minutes on this shit. You did ask for it. Okay, so can I get audio from there to input one? There's, There's the, the uh, 60 hertz hum again. Oh, oh it's just the cable. All right, so this is the uh, 
the the new microphone it's very good quality and uh, yeah hopefully you enjoy it yeah so very good quality <laughs> I could use a pop filter yeah so that's the uh, that's the problem with electric mics mics uh, if you're hearing an echo, it's probably because I have the uh, uh, Reaper is going through there. Okay, was it worth it? Was it worth it? How about uh, proximity? Does it so still sound good when it's back here? Or... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Totally worth it. I can't hear it all that well. Like, I, I want to switch to headphones. Check, check, check. Yeah, so... Yeah, um, so this is the, the new microphone. I think it's totally worth the $3. And... Uh, and I would highly recommend it. It's, it's really great quality, and you can't complain for the price. Uh, this sounds just as good as the top streamers, and um, and if you want a professional streamer sound quality, I, I would highly recommend this. I want to say I'm sorry for that, but I'm not really that that sorry. Um, it, it's hopefully that was worth the wait. <sighs> Stream elements? No, I'm definitely not muted. Yeah, so, um... Is that enough gain? I can actually... What? Way down. Up, 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 up. Alright, so... Yeah, uh, plugging into the Zoom... Uh, what do you call it? Zoom H5 XLR thing. Uh, makes this mic work. So you could connect it to uh, connect it to a DAW. It doesn't sound that bad. Like the distortion is actually kind of cool. <laughs> if you like distortion, it's a really good microphone. <laughs> uh, this cheered me up. This is uh, this is fun. It's pretty fun. Well worth the three dollars. I'm glad I, I'm glad I bought that, and uh, glad I figured out how to use it because I'm sure there are certain situations where that sounds just perfect. I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Um, yeah, sorry to make you wait so long to get that mic working. I didn't think, I didn't know how to do it at first. So uh, glad we figured it out, and uh, yeah, we're gonna wrap it up here. I'm going to eat my lunch. I'm going to get the monthly stream recap published on the blog in case any of you missed that um, or want to see the full list of everything that happened over the past month. We can do that. Thanks so much for all the super chats. It was that's incredibly helpful. And yeah, I appreciate that. See you again next week. Maybe we'll have a guest. I don't know. I don't really I don't really plan these too far in advance. It's it's tricky too. But yeah. Hopefully we'll get one or two videos out of this week. And I will see you next Friday, same time.